confess that I have a very big problem with food. It's not like I eat too much, but I think about food an awful lot. Like, you guys might be wondering where you're going to eat tonight. I'm already on Monday night. Like, I'm, two, I'm three days ahead of you. Um, this is an absolute normal phenomenon for someone like me, who is a second-generation ger- Italian-American. And like many people of my ilk, I grew up with two amazing women in my family, which were my grandmothers. The one on, and they both taught me amazing things about food and about life. The one on the left taught me this awesome um, truism that if someone offers you a meal and you say no, it's the biggest sin in the world. Um, the other one on the right off also taught me this very beautiful truth, which was that no matter what you cook for someone that you love, if you spend time making it and you serve it to them with love, it's a feast fit for a king. Um, so when Sasha asked me to do this talk, I thought, you know what, what can I do that combines my love of design and typography with this innate um, obsession about food? And I had this wonderful idea to do a talk called The Culinary Abecedary, um, mostly because I love the title more than anything in the world, um, and also because it seemed like a great vehicle to sort of combine these two things. And it was going to go something like this. Like I was going to look at fonts, like this insanely beautiful font, um, that evokes lots of things to lots of different people. It's definitely something from another time period. It's definitely ornate. It is rich. It's lush. Um, but for me, it is this. It's a fantastic plate of tramezzini, which is a, a sandwich that you get out in the Veneto. And um, the reason that it conjures up tramezzini in my mind um, is because of um, Café Florian in Piazza San Marco, which is the oldest cafe in the world from 1720. And I was there some years ago with a friend of mine for a birthday weekend. And if you ever go there, you should definitely not sit in the, in the piazza where the guys are playing violins or in the little rooms that are heavenly, just go straight to the back and sit and at the bar with Maurizio, who is the bartender there, and he potentially will make you a big plate of tramezzini as well. Um, or, you know, Pujol is definitely on everyone's list of the top 50 restaurants in the world, and its logo is this fantastic font Mendoza, um, which has some insanely beautiful characteristics. It's a humanist face. It has extremely gorgeous um, very elegant proportions. Um, it is, by just by the very nature of the way it was created, um, super elegant and lush. And yet, for me, it's a plate of escamol, which is um, ant larvae, which we ate at Pujol when I was there with my friends. So it's funny that, for me, that insanely sexy typeface is um, a dish of basically larval ants that were actually kind of good, as long as you forgot that they were actually ants that you were eating. Um, and for most of my young life as a young designer, Gil Sands was one of my absolute favorite typefaces, not the least of which, because of this insanely sexy G, um, I could look at the curves and, the, and just revel in this, this, the forms of this G for hours. And, and yet, disaster happened when I was hired by Benetton in the early 90s to be their corporate art director, and I was unfortunately forced to use Gil Sands, so something that I loved to use every so often was the font that I had to use every day. And my first week there, uh, I had a dinner with uh, Oliviero Toscani, who was the creative director there, and um, Luciano Benetton at Toscani's house, and he, cr- he made me a plate of octopus, which actually looked kind of like that Gil Sands G a little bit. Um, but they weren't like this at all. They, these have the heads cleaned out. The ones he served me were like four inches big, and the heads were filled with octopus head stuff. Um, so I, and I had to eat it because it was the first dinner with Luciano Benetton and Olivia Toscani, and I could hardly choke these things down. So unfortunately for me, Gil Sands is a gross octopus head in my mouth. Um, <laughs> but luckily, a few years later, I went to England, and they also use Gil Sands everywhere because it's so British, but luckily they li- love to use the Gil Sands with drop shadow, um, especially on pub signage, and especially pub signage that is hand-painted on a beautiful pub. And so luckily, thanks to a drop shadow, um, I was able to get the gross octopus out of my mouth and a beautiful plate of fish and chips or some other sort of awesome pub food like a kidney pie or something. Um, so I kind of love that idea, but I thought, you know what, I can't go for 25 minutes with these thoughts. If you want to hear more about like the Vitra weird, uh, I thought it was a brownie, but it ended up being bread with schmaltz on top. Um, uh, we can go out to dinner and I'll talk to you about that. But I definitely knew that there was more to this concept of type and food not just because I love both of those things, but there had to be something else, right? So um, I remembered my favorite author, Vladimir Nabokov, um, who I had known throughout my whole entire, you know, adult life as a reader. And when I worked at M & Company, Tiber and Meyer were 
Tibor and Myra were m major Nabokov fans, and I started to reread the books, and if you have any doubt that he is among the greatest authors that has ever lived, read Ada, read um, Pale Fire, they'll blow your minds. Um, but I remember that he had this weird gift or curse or whatever you want to call it, that he saw letters as colors. Um, he saw a V, the V of his name, as this sort of dusty rose quartz color not to be confused with the pink flannel of an M, but for him a V was dusty rose. Um, or N was this kind of slightly sick, um, oatmeal-y kind of uh, grayish oatmeal color. Um, C was a very beautiful kind of clear light blue color, not to be confused with the azure kind of like uh, mother of pearl of an S. Or um, F was this fantastic alder leaf color. So. This condition is called synesthesia, which is this thing that happens in your brain where you take in sensory perceptions in one sensory mode and you sense it in another. So in his case, he saw letters and he saw colors. So um, when I was a kid, I had this thing where if I ever read about anything like ESP, I was convinced I had it. So I had to really like dig deep to try to see people's auras or to sort of imagine what was in the next room, and it never really worked out. So um, just like that, I went online and I tried to take this test to see that I had this because I wanted to have this gift so badly, right? So I was quickly disillusioned by the fact that I did not have this at all, especially the last question in the lower right. Do certain words trigger taste in your mouth? Does the name Derek taste like earwax? That's actually a true story. You can Google it. There's a documentary about a guy in England who actually was a pub owner, and every time he heard Derek, he tasted earwax, which is troubling because he even knew what earwax tasted like, but um, that he must have had that horrible taste in his mouth a lot because Derek is a relatively common name in England. So, um, so I knew I was just an ordinary guy that didn't have this kind of gift, but I knew one thing, that um, there's certain fonts that say pizza, like this, and there's certain fonts that will never say pizza, right? <laughs> so no matter how much pepperoni or drop shadow or roundedness we do to this um, German black letter font, that's never going to say pizza. So um, I knew that there's this link between food and, and, and type, right? So I decided, let me make a little quiz, and I'm going to send it to a bunch of my friends. And the, the thing was, just tell me what's the first food that comes to your mind without thinking too much, and there's no wrong answers. And I probably screwed up because I used all caps, and potentially a lowercase a is a different thing than a, and a capital A, but whatever. Um, next time I'll do it right. But um, I got a kind of awesome selection of answers from a bunch of different people. And um, some of them were spot on, and some of them were kind of all over the map. Um, the Mendoza Bold A was very, very utilitarian. Eggs, Woolworths, whatever. Um, or a big plate of brown rice. Potentially white rice might have been the lighter weight of the Mendoza Roman, but the brown rice sort of adds a slightly, um, you know, the darker weight. Um, a chunky knockout B is definitely meat across the board, but not like fancy meat. Plain old meat that you might throw on a barbecue, right? That you grill and it doesn't need any special treatment, just kind of like knockout you can throw anywhere and it's no offense to knockout people. But um, it always is awesome. Um, or seminary, a lovely font from the you know, middle to the late 1800s, um, was a lot of things to a lot of people from Amaro to um, potentially lobster. But I typically like this person that was very specific that it was West Coast oysters, not East Coast oysters. And maybe that's because it's kind of, the font itself is a little crinkly, it's a little like crunchy, it's potentially, you know, they say oysters are like kissing the ocean. Um, so there's something about that C that really means oysters to that person. Um, D, the, um, the Quimby D, was, again, meat, but this time it was the fancy meat, right? The seared ribeye, the, the, um, the denigrade, the, um, the bold, rich steakhouse flavors, and potentially a higher price point. Um, a fantastic script like this was definitely some cu uh, cucumber sandwiches or some sort of like ladies who lunch type fare. Um, you know, a Horndon, beautiful F was, whoops, sorry. I clicked too soon, was definitely anything of ec frite, like a big bowl of, uh, bowl of moule frite. Um, G in the Avenir Light was definitely, definitely um, something clean, something healthy, like a wonderful plate of steamed vegetables or a 200 milligram tablet of aspirins, someone said. Um, <laughs> H was a little, the, uh, the Egyptian bold was definitely something a little bit all over the map, but I do like the person that was very convinced that for them it was a gin and tonic. Um, a Scotch Roman, um, somehow weirdly for a lot of people, it was definitely Italian, which is strange. Um, 
but um, something that is at the same time elegant and utilitarian, like a wonderful pasta carbonara. Um, a wonderful sign painter, sign painter font like this was something definitely Coney Island boardwalk, um, like a wonderful plate of fried clams. Um, you get the idea here, right? So people really like a beautiful waters titling was another ladies who lunch kind of thing, like a Waldorf salad. And lastly, um, a Gothic 725L was a beautiful um, plate of beans. And Jonathan Heffler wins the award for the most specific answer. His answer was beans, beans in a can, like the type that are eaten, eaten by grizzled drifters who wear union suits and eat them out of a can. So that he does get the most descriptive, that would make sense because it's Jonathan Heffler. Um, so why does this matter at all? The question does, so even still it mystifies me. But um, I have a design firm called Memo, and we do a lot of food branding um, because I decided to work in the sector that absolutely pays the least. Um, you thought publishing was bad, but actually food branding, I think it bottoms out in food branding. But nonetheless, um, it's more than just for us in our studio, a beautiful logo type or a beautiful sign outside a restaurant. It is the combination of a whole bunch of things. And um, we always start with the idea of the mood of the restaurant, right? Where, when you walk into that place, what are you experiencing? What are you expecting to experience? What flavors are already in your mouth? Um, have you been transported to another time or another place? Um, does that idea of mood translate somehow into the scene of the restaurant? We work very closely with our uh, interior designers and architects to make sure that what happens in the identity is translated into the space. Um, there's the idea of how does that inform the voice of the restaurant? You know, what kind of language do we use to talk about ourselves or themselves? How does the service staff inf talk to the, to the guests? Um, and lastly, all of this contributes, hopefully, to the idea of a culture of the restaurant, which is why um, guests will not only become active, I mean, uh, passive visitors in the restaurant, but hopefully um, very active, you know, brand supporters, and they'll come there every day and tell all their friends. So um, while the typographic choices that I and other people that work in this sector make impact all of these... Um, touch points, I really believe that it's in the first section, the mood, where uh, the effects of typographic and typogra typographic, whew, typographic choices and typography are most uh, acutely felt. So um, the first way is in this idea of a sort of geographic location. You know, like so much of what, what is done in this field and what I have done in the past is really to place you in a time and a place. Like, um, this fantastic logo by Luis Fili for Giuliana's Pizza. Um, besides being gorgeous, you know, if you've been to Viareggio in, in the Italian Riviera, there's these fantastic, fantastic wrought iron signs above all of the beach clubs. And um, to reference that for me is to put the guests in the spirit of that place, casual, slightly exotic, um, insanely fresh food, potentially a pizza right out of the oven, a wonderful glass of rosato, perhaps a wonderful um, plate of cold pasta or a plate of panzanella and a t uh, Tuscan bread salad. But like you're in that place and you taste those foods like almost instantly. Um, we did a restaurant for Mario Batali in the Venetian Hotel, the fakest place on earth. Um, and, um, but this was really meant to actually conjure up the idea of being in Venice, perhaps in the, pia in, in the Piazza San Marco, um, you know, the wonderful uh, oriental um, influences of the architecture there, but also weirdly enough, the food and um, the entire experience. Um, or I am a very big lover whenever I travel of a clam shack, Rhode Island, um, Maine, Cape Cod, and this is a restaurant, a food uh, a store actually that we did for a sister restaurant in Los Angeles called Connie and Ted's. Um, and I really like the idea that you can be in the middle of six lanes of traffic on Fairfax Avenue in LA, and somehow, in your mind, you just got out of the, the ocean after surfing all day and you're having a plate of clams, and like the transportative quality of marks like this just sort of never ceased to amaze me. Um, a lot of our clients talk about the idea of they want their customers to feel like they've gone to another time and a place or a real escape from their lives, and nothing is more um, beautiful than this example by Derek Holt, for, um, you know, when I see that, I'm dressed better than I've ever dressed in my life, and Duke Ellington is playing in the background, and I'm drinking champagne or a martini, and I'm dancing with Fred and Ginger, and um, it's just a fat fabulous experience. Um, and, you know, similarly, Roberto De Vigue did this fantastic identity, and um, when I see this sort of thing, you know, I'm drinking pastis, I'm having oysters, I'm, so again, in a heartbeat, I'm there. 
Um, we did this identity for Schnippers, which is, uh, there's a bunch of them around the city. Again, the idea of conjuring up the mythic American road trip, um, traveling around the country, seeing the grizzled uh, waitress at, you know, on Route 66 and having burgers and the beer and the whole entire thing. Um, but more and more, our, cl our clients are coming to us, and I think this is actually a sort of branding thing across the board, that um, customers really are, are more, almost more interested in not where the food is from and what it's made of, but how does it make me feel? And there's this whole idea of sort of the emotional connections that, that customers have with your brand. Um, we did a logo for a, a chicken place, which was a organic, fresh, natural, handmade, clean, super, you know, s just everything about it was clean and simple. And our approach, as opposed to just making it really grungy, which is a typical move to sort of connote handmade, was just making it as clean and simple as be and as beautiful as possible. Um, I've never quite understood this identity um, from a typographic standpoint because it just seems odd. Um, and yet, from another standpoint, from the emotional standpoint, it's insanely beautiful because they sell these tiny little $1 cupcakes um, that are just in this very beautiful, super clean shop. And for that brief moment in time, you're not an adult. You're a kid again. And the idea of this super kind of very naive and very innocent hand-scrolled typeface really sort of, it's just wonderful how it breaks down the barriers of age and, you know, where I am in my life. Um, Sweet Green, another one, I've just never understood why two E's are back to back and the other two are the other way, but um, again, they don't sell salad, really. What they sell is clean. They're a clean lifestyle. Everything about them is clean and honest and pure, and what better way to say that, not dissimilar to everyone's answers on the Avenir Light quiz. Um, through this simple font. Um, Chipotle, through the years, as you know, has moved farther and farther away from their heritage, heritage as a Mexican brand, and um, their current iteration of the logo is actually that, as clean as humanly possible, because in their minds, they are the absolute antithesis of fast food. So what better way to say that you're not fast food, but sell the idea and the, the sort of emotional connection with um, cleanliness. The fact that a, bur a burrito there is like 1,000 calories and it has 75% of your RDA of sodium, and 100% of your RDA of saturated fats um, is potentially absolutely lying on their part with the clean font, but nonetheless, um, they're, they're trying. Um, lemonade, a brand that's not here but in LA, again, super clean and super simple, but yet insanely casual, insanely um, relaxed. What they are is a farm-to-table concept, but again, really infused with the idea of relaxation and comfort and um, a, s a simple sort of return to, a return to another time. Um, so the, the challenge is, is that so much of what we eat now is much simpler than it used to be. No one wants to go out and have a ribeye for lunch, as much as I'd love to. Um, but everyone really is trying to sell this idea of clean. Um, and the challenge for us is how do you infuse clean with something else? Inde is a restaurant in the um, Nomad District that delivers good karma daily. It's a, it's a vaguely an Indian concept. And I love the fact that although this is ostensibly super clean and super wholesome and modern, and um, it has not sort of lost some degree of ethnicity and perhaps exoticness and just something that is not your normal lunch fare. Um, Oxido on 23rd Street, again, did a really fantastic job of maintaining this idea of a Mexican heritage or a Tex-Mex heritage. Again, super clean, super modern, and yet really beautiful and really evocative with the colors, with the type. It's, it's just, you know, really, I, this is something that I wish I had done. There's a lot of those things out there. Um, Melt Shop, again, it's funny that that 725 was something really simple. A lot of people actually said bread for that font. So Melt Shop, I love this identity only in that it's so insanely simple. How much better is the big black condensed sans serif to say bread? Like they basically sell bread with some stuff oozing out of it. Um, so, you know, it's this idea of this wonderful font, which is as simple as humanly possible, and yet this drop shadow of the, the cheese sort of easing out, which just makes everything kind of right with the world. Um, and lastly, um, we did a restaurant that was unfortunately short-lived, um, which is like a lot of our clients because a lot of them are startups and you never know what's going to last in this crazy world of New York City. But um, for a top chef who decided to open a fast casual restaurant of that served pizza and beer. So it was all about contrast. It was about old and new. It was about top chef doing fast casual. It was about being able to order from an iPad. Um, 
And for us, this idea of, so there's another font besides the pepperoni font earlier on um, that really talks about, you know, the sensuality of that experience, the, the contrast of the, the high and the low. Um, the, you know, for me, but poster Bedoni Italic has always had that, like, you want to wrap your hands around it. It makes you feel comfortable. It makes you feel fantastic. Um, so, you know, I've been really, it's a blessing and a curse to go second to the last, but um, what I loved about this conference is how many times I've heard this idea of um, putting fonts together to tell a story from Eduardo Danilo yesterday talking about um, how they approach putting fonts together for a magazine or um, what Francesco showed us earlier, this idea of putting, uh, a putting, assembling a sort of a palette of fonts. And I was at, one day I was at Mario Batali's house and he was doing a tasting with, some, with a, a chef of his of some, of some um, new dishes. And he was very specific about that thing, that dish needs more lemon because it needs zest. Or that needs more, you know, try some cumin in the dressing. Or, you know, try some parsley on the thing because for him, the ad addition of each of those ingredients was able to, c it was add a sort of flavor to, his, to the dish that he was trying to create. And then I thought about being in a, a crit with Karen Goldberg or someone of that ilk at School of Visual Arts, and she talks very much the same language with her students. You know, that layout needs something bold here. It needs something light up here. It needs something old in this corner. You know, she's able to, again, you know, in cooking, they talk about mise en place, which is where you take all your ingredients and you prepare them on the counter so that when you're ready to use them, they're all ready to go. And I like that idea of thinking about font choices and um, a mood as drawing on all of these different ingredients and putting them together to create that exact thing that you're trying to connote. Um, and uh, Julia Child has this fantastic quote, um, just like becoming an expert in wine, you learn by drinking, you learn about great food by finding the best there is, whether simple or luxurious, you savor it, analyze it, discuss it with your companions, and compare it with other experiences. And I think about what we do as designers or as typographers or as people that design fonts, it's really that. It really is approaching every day, trying new stuff, but the most important part is really figuring out what you've done and analyzing it, and then waking up the next day and doing it again until you get it right. And uh, with that, I say thank you. <laughs>